good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for coming to the latest of these pre-show talks. Uh, my name's Lucinda Morrison. I'm head of press here at the theatre. I'm filling in for the wonderful Kate Moss, who couldn't be with us tonight, but I'm enormously honoured and privileged and delighted to be talking to Paul Miller, the director of this production of Macbeth. So welcome, Paul. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, and it's, um, I should say, first of all, I, maybe I'll do what, what um, Kate normally does and just try and get a sense of how many people have seen this production already. Anybody? Oh, a few. Um, uh, anybody coming tonight? Right, and others, and the rest of you have uh, yet to book your tickets, and um, that's fine, hopefully. Um, I do have to say that uh, you're in for an absolute treat. It's a spectacular production, but because of that, there's quite a lot to get ready, so we do only have half an hour for this talk, so we're going to talk fast. Great. Um, but, um, so, um, Paul, this is, this is a welcome. I mean, we first worked together, I think, at the National Theatre a few years ago. Um, but what I only learnt earlier this year is that, in fact, you are Chichester born and bred. I am, in fact, a Cicestrian, is the posh term for it, yes. And this is the first time that I've worked here. Um, and uh, so it's a real treat and a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And, and, I mean, and literally born and bred. Yes, born and raised around here and thus saw, I think, what was probably my first professional theatre production on this stage. In 1974, I worked out, there was a Christmas show called Follow the Star, which was directed by Wendy Toy. And it was absolutely, mar I remember it vividly. It had a split level set with like a slide on it. And it was a kind of jazz retelling of the nativity story. And I think the now Sir Tony Robinson was in it. And the one thing I can remember vividly was that we got to throw foam snowballs from the stage. And to my great regret, I haven't so far worked out how to get that into Macbeth. <laughs> there's, there's, there's still time. There's I'm couple, still working. It's pre previews. previews. Yeah, previews yes. Absolutely. Watch the space. And so that, that was the first thing you saw here. I'm pretty sure. But, but when did you, I mean, was that what wanted to get you into theatre? Did you do theatre at school here? It was school. Um, the schools around here are fantastic, but my, the key turning point really was going to Bishop Luffer School. And there at that time were uh, a, a lot of fantastic teachers, but four in particular, English teachers, there was a group of them who were very brilliant, funny, clever, imaginative, combative, original, sort of liberal, robust. And they threw themselves into making um, all sorts of off-curriculum things happen because, of course, drama wasn't on the curriculum then at that point. And so everything that we did, they made happen out of school hours. And it was really remarkable what they did. And so I began to get more and more drawn into being in all kinds of theatrical activities and plays and things and began to become more and more imaginatively immersed in that. And at the same time, was coming to, I was coming to see things here, of course, more and more regularly. And um, to my amazement, the other day, I, in a moment when I should have been doing my homework, I went instead onto the Festival Theatre's website, where there's an incredibly good archive. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll work out how many productions I actually saw on here. I thought, oh, I don't know, it might be... 15 or 20, and I worked out I'd seen 35 productions on this stage, which was extraordinary. Most of them through the 1980s, I suppose. So it was the combination of those two things and then working out that you could get on a train and go to London and see plays there, and then it all coalesced. Fantastic. And at what point did you decide that you wanted to be a director? Well, this is where it gets weird because I, I can't explain it because all those things were happening. And then at the most ludicrously young age, I've worked out now, I think it was when I was 16, I decided that I wanted to be a theatre director and sort of made, bent the sort of arc of my life towards making that happen. Um, and astonishingly made it happen, um, which I marvel at and to this day. And did you get encouragement from the I, teachers? And I did. Um, I, I can't see everybody. I need to ask, is Barry Smith here? He's not here. In which case... Uh, 
The others if, are. If, if, if Barry's not here, then I can, then I can tell this story. <laughs> Hello. Barry Smith, who was then the head of English at Bishop Luffer, was directing me when I was still acting in The Importance of Being Earnest. And, um, Which role were you playing? I was playing Algernon. And um, after rehearsals one day, I vividly remember, I was slightly embarrassedly saying to him, look, I think it is, Mr. Smith, I, I've, I've decided I want to be in the theatre. And he, he sort of looked a bit downcast and he started looking at his shoes a little bit and sort of muttering and saying, well, I, the thing is, I, I, I would worry a little bit uh, maybe about your, your range. And I thought, range? What's he going about? And I said, oh, no, no, I don't want to be an actor. I want to direct. At which point his entire countenance lit up and said, oh, that's, oh, that's marvellous. That would be fantastic. And I tried to take it not as a comment on my acting. Um, but he was very encouraging from that point on. Marvellous. Well, we have to sort of gall gallop, gallop ahead because you're, you're now artistic director of the Orange Tree Theatre in Richmond. Yes. Um, but this is, as you said, your, your first production back here on the Festival Theatre stage. So why, why Macbeth? Really because the, the chief sort of thing that brought this about was that my working relationship with John Sim, who I've directed on a number of occasions over many years now, going back to about 20 or more years, and we had direct, uh, worked on a production of Hamlet together at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield uh, nearly 10 years ago. And the Crucible Theatre is a very similar shape and size to this stage, and he was absolutely brilliant in the part, really... Uh, astonishing and I think it only added to his appetite for playing the works of this writer and these parts and he really wanted to play this part and we said we'd work on something else together and it's taken this time and then a whole series of happy circumstances came about last year really where this opportunity came up so we seized on it. Um, and in the meantime, he'd been having conversations with Dervler, and they'd been working on a series together, and it seemed obvious to them, and my, my goodness, it is obvious, they're fantastic together in the two parts. So the whole thing just seemed like a, too good an opportunity to miss. Wonderful. And we don't want to give away uh, too much about the, the staging because it's the lots of wonderful surprises and, and so on. But when... I mean, yeah. I mean, Macbeth seems to me it, it, it's it's a kind of an unusual it, it, tragedy in that it, it takes a lot of staging decisions. I imagine simply because yeah. of the presence of the supernatural, the witches and the hallucinations and so on, alongside the sort yes. of action of a thriller. So, where do you start with something like that? It seems to me, I, in what I thought about it was that it doesn't. Of all the different plays, it doesn't seem really. I don't think to suit relocating to a very recognisable contemporary setting. Others of the plays do, but I didn't think it did, partly because of the supernatural, but also because, weirdly, the modes of killing in the play are so specified and brutal, primitive. And if you're in a world of guns, it suddenly doesn't make any sense. And so I thought it had to be set in some recognisable world that was sort of nearly out of reach, but where you could both recognise a military, patriarchal society, but nonetheless where rather primitive violence was still possible. So that's kind of the, the kind of world we've aimed for, really, I suppose. Mm. But as you said, we're on this very spectacular glass floored set and, yeah. you know, a screen behind. So it, it feels contemporary. So while you're using a lot of contemporary technology. Yes, we, uh, we, the facilities are fantastic and so Simon Dorr, the designer, has come up with this incredible space which also goes a long way, I think, I hope, to answering a kind of key conundrum of this stage and the play. The play is a journey of really two people and then finally one person's sort of journey into the interior, really. It's a psychological play, a psychological thriller, I suppose. And yet it also has these epic things that have to happen. And here's a stage which is an epic stage. And yet, how do you focus it so that this singular psychological journey into an abyss can happen? And um, I, those of you that will see it will I hopefully see that this stage does manages to do both of those things. 
Um, and do you the, manage to use the whole auditorium as well? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I, I mean, were, were there any, I, I, having seen all those 35 productions on this stage, did, was, that, was that a help? Or when you came to actually do it yourself, are you thinking, oh, goodness, now I know? It's a bit daunting when I think of the people that I've seen on this stage. But uh, no, I think it helped. I, I, think, I think that this, the configuration of this stage, which was in its day, you know, in, the, in 1962, a very radical, revolutionary shape of the stage. I think it's probably partly responsible because I came here at an impressionable age for my sense of space, that you have to work in space, not in 2D. You know, the old proscenium theatres, it's about making a, basically a two-dimensional picture that people can look at, and you write your signature on that. Here, it's about space and movement. And so I think it probably was responsible for developing my sense of that. Um, but no, it was a bit intimidating. But of course, what's incredible is because even though I hadn't worked here, I was very, very keenly aware of what the facilities were here, you know, in the 70s and 80s. This place has undergone a radical transformation um, not that long ago. And people like Patrick Garland would absolutely be goggling at the amount of equipment and facilities that there is here now and the, you know, what you can do on this stage. Yeah, yeah. And does that, all that, that new technology, does that really help with the things like the supernatural oh, yes. elements? Yes, 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 hugely, yes. hugely. Again, I don't want to give things yes, away. No, but absolutely yes, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But uh, you, you, you said, I would say, rightly, you didn't want to make it too contemporary. But somehow, Macbeth always does seem to be hideously relevant, and especially at the moment, because it's a play about power and the abuse of power. I can't quite think why that should come to mind at the moment. But It's a stretch, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, that's the other reason, in a way, for not pinning it to, like, making him Donald Trump or something. Because if it, it has to live as a metaphor, and it's better if it does, it's more potent if it does, if you can project onto it and say, oh, my God, that reminds me of X or Y, then it lives more potently than if you're actually depicting X or Y. But, yes, it is hugely a parable about... Uh, the acquisition, the desire for power, the acquisition of power, what you need to have in you to get it, what, you hap what happens to you when you get it, um, and how it can destroy you and all around you. Um, so, yeah, um, we're, str we're struggling for relevance, really, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and perhaps just about, about the, the text, are you doing, are you doing it... I'm cut because again, I mean, Macbeth. It's one of the shorter tragedies, and it, there are no subplots, so it does. It is shorter than King Lear, and it's certainly shorter than Hamlet. Um, it has a lot. Of, it has a, as you said at the beginning, it has a lot of moving parts to it that tend to flesh it out. Um, but I suppose I thought, being on the big stage here, and we needed to put on a bit of a show, and that it is often cut in the smaller theatres. And what, what would happen if we did pretty much? the whole text, with one big example, which is that I've cut, for those of you, no, the, the Hecate scene, about which there seems to be a scholarly consensus that it was written by Thomas Middleton, because it's so tonally different. So we didn't do that, but ev you get everything else else. So you get the full roast dinner. Marvellous. And all the trimmings. And I all think. the trimmings. And all the trimmings. And, but, I mean, that, that just reminds me when you said, for those who know the story, because I'm interested by what you're saying, that you know, we, we can so easily assume that, uh, you know, it's Macbeth. Everybody knows Macbeth, but that's not necessarily it the case. It isn't the case. It's not the case for any Shakespeare play, and people are well advised to bear that in mind, that on any given night, there will be a sizable number of people for whom it is a new play, a new story. Um, and it's working in the theatre, it's the most, it's always surprising when you mention a Shakespeare play and somebody you think has been in the theatre for 40 years goes, oh, do you know, I've never actually seen that play, do you know what I mean? So, um, uh, no, no, you have to tell the story as, uh, as, as if it's a new story, I think. And then on the other side, hand, you know, there are people who've done it for O level and A level and, you yes. know, again, so it's... I've done it for O level here, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you're doing it for a broad, and particularly, of course, on a, in a big theatre like this, you're doing it for a broad audience. So it's got to make sense for 
you know, the widest possible number of people. Mm. Um, so, Paul, thank you very much indeed. And to those of you seeing the show tonight, um, I envy you. I can't wait to see it again. I think it's an absolutely remarkable production. Um, so thank you once again for coming. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.